hello everyone. I'm Michael Tegos, content editor for Smart Karma. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Isabella Zhao. Um, Isabella is an independent uh, research provider and a senior healthcare analyst uh, who has more than 10 years of experience in healthcare investment analysis. She has worked as senior healthcare analyst at CDPQ, uh, the second largest uh, pension fund in Canada for the past two years. And previously, she was the leading healthcare analyst at JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley in Hong Kong. Uh, she has graduated from NYU Stern MBA. Uh, Isabella, welcome. Um, I know you have your uh, presentation for us, so take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I will skip uh, the first uh, slides and go into the topic. Uh, I think uh, many of you uh, have been uh, many attention to China healthcare industry, uh, especially under the COVID-19. And uh, so, and uh, in summary, uh, China healthcare market uh, became the second largest in the world and we think the circular growth will continue and however uh, the, the industry is going through the structural reform uh, which will accelerate innovation and import substitutions uh, favor domestic leading player with innovative product and technology uh, looking at the healthcare stock, uh, which has been always high return and high growth, over 20% uh, in the past decade. And, uh, and uh, if you're looking at the table uh, on the right, you can all see uh, healthcare stock, both A and H share, has been outperformed by the general uh, index uh, since the late of uh, 2019. Uh, right now, both of the PE uh, multiples and the fund holding of healthcare stock has reached a five year historical high. So, in short term, uh, we are cautious uh, because uh, number one, the uh, higher multiples. And the number two, I, uh, we think uh, the market hasn't been fully priced in the potential policy headwinds. And, uh, and the pharma industry growth will continue to be low at the single digit. Under this environment, uh, we favor uh, the names with rich pipelines, such as Henry, CSPC, Innovet. Uh, well, domestic medtech players such as Mary and Megapod will benefit from the import substitution and also the infrastructure upgrade demand. Uh, on the other hand, uh, service companies are relatively immune uh, uh, for the policy risk. So, Wuxi Biotech, TechMed, and IR Hospital will be uh, less risk. Uh, next page. So the next slides uh, were talking into detail uh, on the healthcare uh, markets in size. Again, the second largest market, uh, which will expect to reach US dollar 2.5 uh, 2 trillion by 2013 at a CAGR of 8%. Uh, by reference, the CAGR of U the, the global pharma market growth will be at uh, two, two to three uh, percent for the decade. And uh, uh, the structural reform will favor large and quality players. Uh, since the government have implemented policies such as uh, zero separate drugs from the hospital, uh, will reduce the the corruption and increase the bargaining power and sales growth for, for drugs with better efficacy. Also, the mandatory BE study for generic drugs will rule out unqualified manufacturers and increase the consolidation of the whole industry. And the drug sales restriction less than 30% of total at hospital. Uh, imply higher growth at pharmacy and the lower tier hospitals. And uh, obviously, the profit pool is shifting away from generic products towards more innovative drugs. And also, uh, for Chinese companies, 
uh, we have higher R&D productivities because number one, uh, majority of them are not pursuing purely new innovation. Instead, they are trying to work on uh, the derivative new product based on the existing um, molecule, uh, such as me better, uh, me too, and follow ons. And also, uh, China R&D cost is much lower, about one third of that in US and Euro, and because we have a lower, uh, lower price, the domestic R, uh, CRO and CMO services. And uh, for the investment themes uh, for the next couple of years, number one, again, uh, we think the price pressure will continue and the fully implementation of four plus seven centralized procurement will continue. And the third round will begin in July and the short will uh, wet spread across the regions. And uh, number two is the uh, centralized procurement for high-end medical consumers. And uh, so the timeline was uh, laid out in last year and will uh, fully uh, implement it uh, in 2020. But unlike uh, drugs, uh, we think uh, for the high value consumables, the price cut will not be severe uh, compared to the generic drugs. And uh, number three is the accelerating approval and reimbursement for innovative drugs. Uh, we can all see, and uh, in the last round, uh, 17 cancer drugs in the reimbursement list receive an average price cut of 50% and 10 of them are innovative drug launch since 2017. And, uh, but the volume gain was much uh, more than offset uh, the price cut. And the number four is most important, uh, DRG reimbursement uh, policies uh, will rapidly uh, roll out nationwide. Uh, we think that's the major uh, uncertainty for the drug uh, for the next two years. Um, for next, uh, we're gonna go into the subsectors. So uh, for the pharma, uh, pharma pharma industry, and uh, I, if you're looking at the chart uh, on the bottom, the first chart has been shown the industry sales and uh, end growth continue to decline, and the industry is transforming from volume-based to quality-based growth. Again, uh, we uh, want to emphasize uh, the high growth uh, between 2012 to 2016, um, above 20% growth over that period uh, was mainly driven by um, public insurance expansion, but that's not to be the case for the next decade. And, um, and the, the uh, overall system is uh, improving and with some short-term uh, negative, but overall the long-term growth remain positive. Uh, these slides show uh, China healthcare system is very complex and uh, inefficient. But again, we are in the structural reform period and try to improve that system. And for the investment criteria and for biopharma industries. Uh, so uh, we think company with me to me better and follow on strategy have proved to be successful in China for the 10 years and that won't be the case in the future. Innovative driven uh, company with uh, new uh, products and the proved clinic value to meet unmet demand and the good commercialized ability will win. So basically, uh, the biopharma industry in China is copying the model from the U.S. If you look at the example in the U.S., uh, we have a big pharma, uh, which have a very large scale and 
and the platform a lot of cash and uh, uh, they are they both have a generic drug and innovative pipelines uh, that's the same case in china uh, the front runner are Hongrui, CSPC, Biofarm, and they can leverage uh, their existing prof um, portfolio uh, from the insurance coverage and continue to enjoy, enjoy double-digit growth. Uh, while they have a rich pipeline, may not be the real innovative drug, but still can, can maintain double-digit growth for the next five to 10 years. And so uh, the, the second business model is the real innovative biotech names, uh, such as Innovate, Belgian, Zlab, and uh, they are not making a lot of money and a lot of R&D uh, expenditures, uh, but they are the driving force uh, for the next decade. Um, the second subsector is medical device. Again, uh, China medical device is relatively smaller uh, than uh, the pharma, only accounts 40% of the total, uh, versus uh, um, more than half in the US and uh, Europe. So there's a lot of growth potential. And uh, mm, the multinational companies still dominate the high-end market, and the leading domestic player only have less than 5% shares. And we see uh, a lot of policy change, um, same as the generic drugs. But the most importantly, uh, the policy tailwind includes uh, the import substitution, and um, which will further market consolidations and benefit leading uh, leading players, and uh, for the uh, price pressure on local player may not as severe as on generic uh, drugs. So uh, we prefer innovative high value players such as Mary and Michael Pot. And the third subsector we're talking about is the CROs. Uh, if some of you have read my notes on CROs, uh, which has uh, drawn a, a lot of attention for the past three years, I think, uh, I'm one of the uh, um, longest analysts who cover Wuxi Pharma um, since 2010, while they still listed in US. So there's a, a lot of changes, and uh, but but in summary, uh, the outsourcing uh, market is gonna grow in at a much faster rate in China both small molecule and biologic. And uh, with the favorite government policy, and also is less, um, less um, risk in terms of uh, the, the price uh, cut. And uh, we expect the small mo molecule CRO and uh, the biologic CRO gonna grow at least 10% and 20%. Uh, respectfully in the next five years. And the leading player, including Wuxi Biologic and Tegamat. And the next, um, but not the least, is the private hospital market. As you may already know, uh, still 90% of the hospital in China are still a uh, public ho hospital. But uh, uh, the, land, the competitive landscape is changing since 2014 uh, when the government encouraged primary capital to invest in the health, healthcare service market. The primary hospital will continue to grow uh, at above 20% CAGR and to reach 78 billion in 2020. And again, is um, the favorite government policy, also uh, the demographic factor to benefit these growth. And uh, the most important thing is uh, for primary uh, healthcare service markets, uh, they uh, have, uh, they don't have the price uh, control by the government because most of their service are not uh, paying by government um, 
insurance. And uh, so uh, we see the leading companies such as IR Hospital, they do have price power. Uh, their ESP has been increased uh, at 10% uh, every year. We'll continue to do so. Uh, next, uh, I'm gonna go through some selectively uh, 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 healthcare names. Uh, for pharma, uh, we like Hengrei and CSPC and Innovet. Again, uh, we want to highlight and, uh, and both of them are very attractive uh, with uh, existing portfolio and Hengrei is dominant in oncologies and uh, CSPC is cardiovascular. So their ex existing portfolio and continue to uh, to deliver 15 to 20 percent growth and in the next three to five years and while they rapidly uh, ramping up their um, pipeline um, but Hongrei is now trading at the premium um, above their uh, historical average, uh, we suggest to wait uh, for, uh, for the re rating. And while CSPC is trading at a reasonably um, multiples, and uh, uh, we believe uh, investor can take the opportunity of the first half weakness, uh, um, which they will report the results next week for 2Q and uh, to build some positions. And next is uh, uh, Tagmat. As I mentioned, uh, Tagmat is the uh, largest small molecule clinical CRO player in China, has enjoyed a um, robust 30% uh, bottom line growth Kager for the past five years. And the demand from small molecule clinical CRO will continue to grow. And uh, the company uh, uh, has been proposed a uh, share IPO, which gonna happen in the second half of 2020. And uh, which uh, we think gonna uh, further uh, strength investors sentiments on the CRO sectors if you're looking at the uh, HCR CRO uh, subsectors, which have been uh, performed extremely well uh, since 2019, and most of the stock has been doubled, uh, we think that's going to be the similar case uh, for TechMath. And the last but not the least, IR. Again, uh, without uh, price pressure and uh, uh, from the policy risk, uh, primary hospital is always the favorable uh, subsector for many loan-owning funds. Uh, IR is the best managed and best well-known primary hospital chain in China and has been delivering consistent uh, thirty percent bottom line growth uh, for the past ten years. Actually, uh, they listed in two thousand nine, so yes, uh, on ten years um, history in public markets. And um, I don't want to go into much detail. You can uh, read my notes. Um, but uh, in terms of the valuations, again, uh, is trading at a historical high. And we, uh, we believe uh, the growth this year will be slower. Um, of course, uh, also the management has reformed 30% growth, but we think the first half uh, will be much slower because uh, the disruption caused by the COVID-19, both in China and in overseas markets, which will continue. Uh, so um, we suggest uh, you uh, you uh, look for uh, some weakness to build your position. I think that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take uh, more questions. Great, thank you, Isabella, for this uh, great overview of the industry uh, as well as uh, those actionable ideas. Um, 
Yeah, I not will. much, not much actionable because most <laughs> of the names are too expensive. But again, I want to emphasize. Uh, we're not, uh, um, I'm a long-term investor, so we look at a good quality company with uh, 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 higher ROE and higher higher growth potentials. Uh, we're, we're making money from the actual growth, not from the multiples, yes. But uh, again, you don't want to buy things too expensive, yeah. Uh, I do believe, uh, I do think there's some bubbles uh, on the healthcare names. If you're looking at the 1Q result, uh, some company uh, stock continue to uh, increase, expect uh, uh, on satisfied result. So there is a bubble, but again, uh, as long as we still wear masks uh, and the COVID-19 things continue to uh, going on and we don't think there's a big pushback or pullback uh, on the healthcare names, but uh, the most important thing is the policy, uh, which I think will be the uh, Head wing for the rest of the year, uh, probably happen in the second half. Yeah. Uh, I will be taking some questions from the audience. We have quite a few coming in. Um, so, um, would there be um, would there be one subsector that uh, you would advise uh, investors to look deeper into? Um, you you have already talked about some of the stocks, but um, uh, what's your view there? Uh, one subsector? Yes. Only one. That's great. That's the question. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's very difficult uh, uh, question to answer, and uh, it all depends on uh, his in um, his investment return requirement and holding period, right? So. Um, uh, healthcare is very broad uh, sectors. We have seven subsectors, and uh, each of them has different characteristics. And uh, I I remember the day when I was a sales analyst. Analyst one company is analyze a whole subsector. Uh, so it's very hard to generalize. But again, I, I do think uh, uh, biopharma, biotech we still have much more potential. And also the multiple is, um, looks like uh, very expensive right now, but if you look at the market cap, and uh, in terms of uh, compared to US, we are at least uh, 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 five or 10 years behind. And uh, our R&D capabilities are at least 20 years behind. And uh, so um, there's a lot of um, potential over there. Uh, so that's one sector I think investor can continue to pay um, very important um, attention. But again, and the invest in biofarm is uh, it's very specialized sector. You need some uh, uh, industry um, knowledge or may not be the medical background, but you have to know um, the over, overview competitive landscape and uh, how things gonna play. And very importantly in China, how the policy gonna play, yeah. I see. Um, so another question is, uh, how much government oversight is there over the emerging big pharma industry in China? Um, and have there, have there been any, uh, any big cases of corruption there? Uh, I don't understand the emerging biopharma. You mean the innovative drug company? Uh, so uh, emerging big pharma. So presumably, you know, the, the industry that will become uh, China's own version of big pharma. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, he or she probably uh, thinking about Hongrei or Sanobiofarm, about the, the uh, dog, doctor for big case. Okay. Um, sales rebate to doctor is very normal in pharma industries. Even so, in US, I, I'm not sure 
uh, maybe uh, some of you remember the movie called Love and Drugs, right? And uh, and so so that's normal case uh, across pharma industries. And China government has been um, pushing um, to to improve the situation in China. In China, that's uh, why they began to implement zero markup separation drug from uh, the hospitals and a lot of these um, policy try to reduce the markup along the value chain. Uh, that's the whole purpose of the structural reform. So I think Henry CSPC all these leading a uh, big pharma. Yes, uh, they they um, they have more than twenty or thirty percent of uh, sales uh, expense ratio. Um, that portion gonna decrease over time. And uh, at, at the same time, a doctor or a hospital gonna emphasize more clinic uh, uh, value. That's why when I mentioned DRG, DRG means that diagnosis a related group, which gonna link uh, the patient reimbursement uh, uh, systematically, automatically to certain uh, drug group. So, uh, so the doctor and the hospital gonna uh, reduce the prescription of overused uh, drug or even medical device. And um, that's the major risk I mentioned before will be uh, harsh for me too and the follow, follow on drugs. So as China slowly moving towards the model in US and um, that portion gonna decrease. But uh, again, this is a structural change gonna take a long time. So I think uh, there's mm, the sales uh, rebate and the sales commission gonna continue exist at least for the five or to 10 years. But uh, um, the clinic uh, value and for the doctor or for the patient, for the insurance reimburse gonna get more and more emphasized, yeah. I see. Well, Isabella, thank you very much for uh, taking the time today. Um, there's a lot more questions from the audience, but unfortunately that's all the time we have. Um, but everyone can uh, contact Isabella through the details on the uh, on the event ebook, um, and uh, perhaps send your questions uh, there as well. Uh, Isabella, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye.